Hey, I'm John Gibbons. Welcome to my studio. This is where I've worked from in Carlow in Ireland for the last number of years. It's, uh, it's my favourite place to go. Even if I'm not making music, I just like to sometimes sit here and drink in the atmosphere. It's nice and quiet, tucked away from the world, and it's uh, the polar opposite of when I'm live at a gig. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the process that I use when I'm making music, what inspires me to make music, and we'll use as a focal point for that my track Let Me Love You, which came out a few years ago and was a big hit for me. It's one of my favourite tracks, and in terms of production, um, at the time it was certainly the best thing I had done at that point, so I think it's a really good one to chat about. If you're unfamiliar with it, here's a quick listen. Challenges regarding making music. Where do I begin and where do I end? There are so many, aside from the technical end of things, which was very challenging for me in the beginning. Uh, when I started producing dance music, um, I, I really struggled. And there's no point pretending it was all love and roses and light for me at the start, it wasn't. I really found it difficult to get to grips with the synthetic feel of what I was doing. Um, eventually it clicked and that was great. I just kept turning up, kept doing it, kept doing it and I grew, I grew to love it then as I got better. But some of the challenges for me are, a big one for me is if I'm producing a track with a specific goal. So say for example, I'm working to, I do a lot of work with other people, I uh, produce for them or with them as well. So let's say I have a specific brief um, and it's, the brief is to produce a track in a particular style or a particular way that I wouldn't normally do it or isn't my favorite. Well, then it's to put my own bias aside and approach the track objectively as opposed to subjectively. And that's quite tricky because music is a subjective thing. It comes down to taste. But if I'm working with a client and that client wants something specific, I will always discuss, well, how about we try A, B, C, or D. But ultimately, if they are hard and fast and have decided they want it a specific way, it's my job to do that and to put aside what I feel is best for the track can be quite difficult i'm able to do it it's been a lot of practice over the years and sometimes i'm right and sometimes i'm wrong but it's not about that like i said to you before in my opinion it's about doing what's best for the track and if somebody else it's their dream it's their vision it's their idea and i'm just working with them well then i have to seed my idea and my subjective view on the track and what way it should be to theirs um, equally if I'm just doing my own thing here, um, my background in dance music is far more underground than the music I'm probably best known for now, which is quite commercial. Um, I love both strands of it, and I love pop music. I love lots of different styles. That's why I ended up kind of leaning towards the more commercial end of dance music, because it scratched both itches for me. And I still produce a lot of underground stuff under pseudonyms and aliases. But if I'm producing, let's say, something that is earmarked to be the next single under my own name, Sometimes I have to put aside what I feel would work in a club and focus on radio and then marry it, come back to it again and marry what would work in a club and on radio because the end result there can be quite, quite different to, especially in terms of the length of a track because obviously if you're making music for radio, it has to be quite short and snappy and to the point and you have to pack a lot in in a short space of time. With club music, you can be a lot more expressive. You can tease things out over a longer period of time. And sometimes trying to balance those two sides of my musical brain can be a real challenge. So I might decide, right, I want to do 16 bars or 30 seconds of a long breakdown here because it's tense and it builds and then eventually we crash back in with a drop. But radio, might, radio listeners might not be patient enough for that. So I somehow have to start chopping and start hacking. That's a challenge for me to be able to, as I would sometimes egotistically think, sacrifice my artistic um, <laughs> new in favor of what the commercial sensibilities are. And I'm, I'm being careful about my language here because there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. Sometimes people, um, especially in dance music or the more underground scene will, you know, they'll see commercial as a bad thing. Sometimes people working in pop would see dance music as something a bit far out there and a bad thing. Everybody likes their own tribe. 
And there is a tendency, I think, as humans to kind of protect your own tribe at the cost or to the detriment of the other tribes out there. Thankfully, I think we're in a musical place where the tribes are all starting to merge, you know, and they're, they're starting to interbreed now at this stage. So what's hip hop? What's, what's trap? What's dance? What's rock? It's, you know, it's, it's all starting to blend, which I think is great because I love all of that. The purists don't like it in a lot of cases, but there's so much choice out there. I mean, if you're a purist and you just love techno, or you just love drum and bass, or you just love pop music, you're free to stick to that too. But as a producer, I like to mix and match because I'm into lots of different styles of music. So the challenge for me is to be able to satisfy the business end of it and the expectations around that, because there are expectations, it's the music business, um, you're not going to get away on Spotify if you're looking for 100 million streams on a track with a three minute intro to a track because people will skip. So that is a commercial sensibility when making a track. Three seconds is far more like it. Um, but sometimes I would like a two or a three minute intro rather than a three. It's trying to blend the two, marry the two. That's where extended mixes of tracks come in. That's where you can be really creative. I will quite often on my own music uh, remix it under an alias and then I really get to scratch the dance itch with the feel or maybe the, the, the life essence of the original track that I've made. So that's that's probably the biggest challenge for me. Then another one is, uh, well, a, a big, big challenge for a lot of people is trying to earn a living from music. That can be a very difficult thing. And people again think it's, oh, it's great if tracks on the radio and you're doing gigs, you must be making a fortune. Sometimes you can have good times financially, but equally you can have absolutely horrendous times as any artist will go through, you know? I mean, we're not all Calvin Harris or Beyonce with endless streams of money coming in. And again, these people have worked to where they are as well. And Calvin, Calvin Harris was working in a, a fish factory until suddenly his music got heard and it went from there and he had what it took to get from here to here. So it's not like it was handed to him, you know? But um, yeah, earning a living can be tough and for any of those who pulled through the COVID years, it was really, really, really difficult for so many artists then, not just financially, but in terms of headspace, in terms of not knowing, would we ever get back to it? If we do, when will that happen? It was not to get too dramatic about it, but sometimes it was a little bit like being in musical jail, but not knowing when your sentence ends. And I think from, from, from certainly some of the movies I've watched and the books I've read about people who've gone through experiences in wartime, not knowing when you're going to be released is the hardest thing of all. Um, and I think as humans, we, we like to be able to kind of put a structure on things and we need, to, we need to be able to see the walls. If there's a wall or there are bars there, I need to see them. But when they're invisible, that can really mess with people's heads. And it did mess with a lot of heads, including mine during COVID. Um, the upside of it is a lot of time to learn, a lot of time to grow personally and musically without the distraction of gigs. And I, I use the word distraction in the best possible way. I love gigs. It's my first love before I ever produced. I was playing live and doing gigs. I was in bands before I became a DJ. So it, I just like performing. Um, but without that there, because that can take you away from the studio a lot. If you're touring, you're not in the studio. And while you can bring a laptop and you can work off headphones, it's not quite the same thing. Personally, for me, some people are great that way. I like to get into the studio and remove all distraction. Um, so I spent all my time during COVID in the studio with no other distraction, bar my own head. So once I sorted out my head a few months in, the amount of learning and musical growth that I experienced was, I would say, more in those two years than the previous 10 it was remarkable because it was just focused attention to the one thing and that was production. So again, that was a very challenging uh, time for me. Financially, it was tough too. And just briefly getting back to earn a living from it. A lot of people, I think, particularly when, um, particularly in the celebrity age, which I think we're in now, where everybody's, the best of everybody's lifestyle is on display and you go onto Instagram or social media and everybody having the best life ever. People on TikTok are just showing their best side all the time. Um, it can be very easy when you're starting off in music and if you want it as a career to look at that and say, well, it's not working out for me for the first two months. I'm going to throw my hat at it and just, just quit because, it, because I'm not making money. It takes, in most cases, years and years and years. You know, for, 
for every Avicii who spotted early or for every Beyonce who worked from a very young age in Destiny's Child and continued on her career. There are thousands, if not millions of people who A, haven't made it or B, if they have, have had to do it the long way. There aren't that many 18 and 19 year old superstar DJs out there or superstar pop stars or whatever it is. It takes time. You might have a hit, you might disappear, you might come back with another one. And that's that's the tricky one. It's that second song or second album or, you know, people talk about the sophomore years in music. That's the tricky one. How do you follow up something that you poured your your initial emotion and energy into the first album or the first song or whatever it might be, there were generally no expectations. And then boom, suddenly you've got people watching you, you have music business expectations and you have to reproduce that. That can be really, really difficult. Um, so that's, that's been a challenge as well. One that luckily I've managed to surmount. Um, but again, I'm always looking to the next thing. I want the next thing to be bigger. I want it to be better. First and foremost, I want it to be better. And then I would like from a career sense for it to be bigger. And that doesn't always happen. And again, another challenge, here we go, is to, to actually just take it on the chin and keep going. Just because a song that you've released isn't as big as the last one or your biggest song, that doesn't mean it's a failure. Failure is, I mean, you, sh you shine the light of perspective on success or failure. One person's failure is another person's success. I can turn my failure into a success just by shining a different lens on it. So I'll take an example of that. Um, I had a string of kind of big hits with Your Love, PYT, uh, Would I Lie to You, Sunglasses in the Rain. And then I released My Reflection, which was very different. It was a slow track, not even a pop track. It was quite out there and very different to anything I had released up to that point. But it was a labor of love for me and I was delighted the label went for it and it didn't do anything in terms of numbers compared to what everything else did. Initially, I was devastated. I thought, how could people not appreciate this? And then I realized, no, it's not about that. It's not about the numbers. The success for me is to get this track that I never in a million years thought I would be able to write, produce, and release and get out there into the world on the label I was with. That's the success for me. And that shows a different side to me as a producer. And subsequently, in the years to come, my reflection has quite often been referenced as a track that would have got me a lot of other work, got me remix work, got me different clients as a producer outside of my own artist project. Um, and there's more success that came from that track. You know, it's about how we view these things. It doesn't have to be a hundred million or a billion streamer or whatever it is. That's great, that's successful. That's financially rewarding if that happens to somebody, potentially, but that's not necessarily the measure of success. So I would, I think one way to mitigate a lot of the angst and the anguish around that, particularly for producers, DJs, musicians, whatever it is, starting off, decide what your success looks like first and foremost, and go for that. Don't look at what was successful for somebody else. Don't decide that because Ed Sheeran is successful and that's what he takes to be successful. Doesn't mean I have to be, just because he gets a billion streams on a track doesn't mean that I failed if I get 100 million. I'm using big numbers here, obviously, but that's not failure. Maybe it is to Ed Sheeran, I don't know, but it doesn't have to be to me. And then, you've, then you have something to work towards. Stop looking at what others are doing and what their benchmark for success is. Look at your own. So what's successful for me with this track, A, B, and C? Right, have I ticked those boxes at the end of it? Oh no, I only got A and B. Still successful. You had three measures of success there. You ticked two, so it was successful two times over. That's the way I approach it now, and I get far less stressed about the production process because I don't have the same level of expectation around my own music. You left me love.